think, Sandy, you ready? Yep, I think let's go ahead. Can we start with a uh, welcome to everybody. Happy New Year. We're all back. It's good to be back. Uh, let's start with our guest, a roll call. Can you do that, Kelly? Yep. Angela. Uh, Brad? Uh, yep, I'm here. <laughs> you guys have any community updates during this time, just as a reminder? can share those. Christina? Connie? Here, present. Daniel Brown? Daniel is here. We're meeting tomorrow morning with uh, some Livingston County municipal officials, uh, some concerned residents, and a couple of Eagle staffers uh, for our, our counties and regions down here uh, that have helped us out in the past um, just to talk through some of the community concerns and issues that have come up. Thank you. Daniel Burlingame. David Norwood, David Wynn, I'm here. Elizabeth, Gail Mansowitz, Gail Dugan, I saw him on there. I see his name. Yeah, I see his name too. So counting. Jason Legowski. I'm hearing a local update. Jeffrey Dutton. Joe. Yes, I'm here. John. Yep, I'm here. Justin. Ken, Laura, Leah, Lynn Knopf. Here. Lynn McIntosh. I'm here. It's very interesting you have the two Lynns right next to each other. <laughs> it's quite a pattern there. Hey, I, um, I just got a map for the Rockford area from the, the eagle that looks like the expansion. I mean, there's going to be more expansion. I Abby in the Fulton Township. Um, have, you, have you seen the latest on that? I haven't. Is it a map specific to the Wolverine investigation? Yeah, it's a heat map. It looks like the contamination is, is there's, they're getting exceedances further south. Um, which is unfortunate, um, but so I'm going to try to get a little more information on that. Um, maybe I'll check in with Eagle about that, but it's mm -hmm. it's that uh, we're it's it's still a problem in, in Portland, and <sighs> I just hope they don't keep finding more places. So I know of another homeowner who did have it in the well somewhere else. So anyway, done. I have an ongoing concern for that and um, just wanted to mention that. That's it. Thanks, Margaret. Sense. Margaret Brum. Mary. I'm here. Pam. Yes. Patty Baldwin. I'm here. Richard Burns, Rick Rodisky, here, Bob Pataki, Tamara, Sandy, I'm here, Shalene, Stacy Taylor, I'm here. 
Teresa Landrum. Tony. I'm here. Uh, a couple of a couple of updates um, on um, January 28th, Sunday, January 28th. Uh, there will be a screening and, and discussion um, of the No Defense film sponsored by Representative Sharon McDonald of Troy. That will be in Troy at the Troy Public Library. Uh, it's free to the public. I'll shoot something around. Um, so that's in the uh, in, in Troy. And then the other thing is um, in Oscoda uh, on the 18th of January, it's actually a virtual uh, meeting. Uh, at which the Air Force will announce the results of its review of two interim remedies that were announced by the Under Secretary of Defense in August. Um, the first under the national policy that uh, they put in place, plus an additional two more, um, which is a we're hoping it's going to be a really big deal. And if anybody's interested, there there is a link, and we we're happy to share it. Thank you. Tony, is that part of the RAB meeting or is that part of a uh, uh, now meeting or no, something we, else? No, actually, um, Abby, it's it's a special meeting that the Air Force is called. It's the Air Force is is going to make the presentation that night, and it's it's separate and apart from the RAB. And um, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good to know. I hadn't heard Thank about you. that one. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Tyler. Uh, Bill Burnett. Here. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> now we have Dave Banlow. Um, he oversees the ride database. Um, last in November, we had someone from Water Resource Division come give a presentation on the My Enviro, how people can find information and ride um, houses the RRD um, stuff in it. So, Dave? And Dave, sure. Dave used to be my assistant over in the Grand Rapids office uh, as district supervisor. And so, Dave has intimate knowledge of PFAS sites and in Grand Rapids. And so he's uh, kind of an expert on a lot of these things, but has decided to take this job specifically to, to uh, head up the database uh, that houses all of RRD's information on contaminated sites in the state, which is numbering how many, Dave? 30,000 or some ridiculous number like that? Yeah, in, in that ballpark, yeah, about 20,000 Part 201 sites and maybe another 10,000 underground storage tank sites in that oh. ballpark. Perfect. We'll take it away, Dave. OK, thanks, Abby. Um, yeah, just by way of introduction, I noticed a lot of familiar names on the roll call, so good to see those folks still active. Um, I worked, uh, I have an environmental engineering degree. I worked for 10 years or so in the consulting, private consulting, doing the same kind of work, um, then came to Grand Rapids as a project manager. And then as a supervisor, um, as Abby said, worked with her. She she bore the brunt of a lot of the PFAS stuff her and Karen Boris did. She just asked me to do everything else. So. <laughs> right, Abby? And he did a great job at it. <laughs> so, um, and then just about two years ago, I, I took this job um, managing our database called RIDE. And I did it because I, as a supervisor and, and as a project manager, I was really interested in knowing where risk was, where contamination was, where it wasn't, where the highest risk was, where it wasn't. And we had all these different databases and spreadsheets where we were trying to keep track of this stuff. And I was very interested in consolidating that and pulling that together. Um, Sarah Pearson at our, at our shop, um, she's in, drinking water division now, but she sort of started ride and I kind of took things over from her. Um, so I'm going to share my screen if that's OK. And walk through a couple things. Can you give me a thumbs up, Bab, if you're seeing that. Yep, looks good. Great, great. So I'll drop this link in the chat. This is a 
just a public web page um, and it's on our Eagle website. Um, and we have, you can see by the URL, we've got all our maps and data kind of in one spot and ride is um, one of those links with all our maps and data. So RIDE's a database, it's called the Remediation Information Data Exchange. And if you scroll down on this web page, it gives you an explanation about what RIDE is, um, houses our information for the Part 201 sites like PFAS sites and also the Part 213 sites, which are leaky underground storage tank sites. Um, we've got an internal version of RIDE, so we use it to track money, we use it to track submittals that come in, we use it to track um, narratives or site write-ups that we're doing um, for these sites. But there's also a public version of RIDE that's available to you or anyone else in the public. Um, through that, you can become a RIDE user, but that's really only useful if you intend to submit documents <clears throat> To Eagle. So typically the ride users, the third party users, they're only going to be your consultants and your liable parties. So um, a, a typical user who's just looking for information, they don't need an account. You don't need to follow the steps to get an account. Um, everything's available that the third party has. The only difference is you can't hit the plus sign to add a submittal to us for review. <coughs> So if you scroll down on this, um, we can open the application. There's some some other stuff on this page, some just introduction videos and all the way down at the bottom. There's some links on how to become a user. And then we've got some guides and frequently asked questions down here at the bottom of the page. Let's open it up. So this is what ride looks like when you land on it. It's got different buttons here. And probably the most useful button, the thing that people go to the most is this inventory of facilities. Um, we'll get to there in a second. We've got some other things. So this, if you click it, it takes you back to that page I just showed you. So that's our information and resources. We've got some statistics. If you click on that, this gives you some information about what the inventory of facilities is, how many reports we've received, how many we've approved, how many we've denied. Um, this is all required by statute for us to report out to the public, and so we house it here. Um, go back. We've got a link to our Freedom of Information Act site. So this, if you wanna submit a FOIA request, you can go there, it links you to that place, become a ride user. Um, Environmental Mapper, if you guys haven't seen or been familiar with that, um, links to that. Um, we also have information about the underground storage tanks, all the underground storage tank sites. This part 211, Every underground storage tank is regulated by part 211. If it leaks, it's regulated by part 213. So the inventory of facilities is where we house all of the locations that are regulated by either part 201 or part 213. When you think of ride, think tables. So this first page, when you go to the inventory of facilities is kind of like an Excel Microsoft Excel table. It's got columns and it has rows. If you want to, if, if you're looking at these columns and you want to add a column, maybe it, you think that there might be a column that's useful that isn't on the table, you can go to display and say I'm interested in what Eagle district is this in. I click that and that row now appears on the table. OK, for all of these, um, we have, um, if you scroll to the right, and it gets a little, it can get a little confusing because I've got a scroll bar here for the main page, but then I've got a scroll bar here for this particular table. You kind of got to pay attention to where you are. Um, 
But off to the right of all these rows, there's an ellipses, three dots. And when you click that, that gives you some more specific information about this site. If we look at 213, a 213 site, they're a little further ahead than 201. We hope to get um, the 201 sites looking a little bit more like the 213 sites this year. But if you just take this site as by way of example, you click the ellipses, we've got different what we call panels or ribbons that you can get information from. So for example, if I am interested in this Vincent Oil Company and I want to look at the tanks, I can open this up, scroll down, and I can say, okay, here's the tank ID. Its status is this has been removed from ground. It's used to store gasoline, that kind of thing. If I want information about the release of that tank, I can open this up. This gives me the release ID. It's a confirmed release. Its current classification is unknown, so on. We also have something called location submittals. This isn't going to be as useful to you as a member of the public. This is more the portal for consultants to come in. They can open this up and they can scroll down. And if I was logged in like a consultant would be, there'd be a little plus sign over here on the end. And if I wanted to submit, say, a closure report for this particular release at this tank, I'd select the plus sign and be able to submit that. The thing that I think will be the most useful for this group is files, location files. When you open that up, it opens up a table of the files that we have that have been converted to electronic format and have been marked with a security level of public. Okay, so the idea is that eventually we will have all our site files converted to electronic format and all of them will be available to you without a freedom of information act request they'll be available click of a button and so a couple caveats with that one is that although we have over a million documents in the system so far we've got a long way to go so they're digitizing, we, there's literally, literally an army of contractors. I don't know how many they're up to, 30 or 40 contractors plus our staff scanning every day. They scan in over a thousand documents every day. So we keep growing, it's a big effort, but there are boxes and boxes and boxes left to go. So some files might not be in here that you're looking for, but a lot are. Um, so let's. Let's go out of the 213 locations because you're more interested in the 201 locations. If at any point, say you're searching and you type in Manton under the city, I'm sorry, I'm going a little fast. Did you catch that? If you, you have your column heading here, but you can search right underneath that. So if you select this, you can now either scroll and select something or you can type and say Cadillac and find it like that. And you can do that for any one of these columns. The other thing you can do that is kind of interesting is right next to any one of these columns. See that little up arrow? You can click that. Let me clear my filters. So if at, at any point you're typing and um, you kind of want to clear everything out and start from scratch. You hit this clear filters button. But this is like a sort. So if I do that, I get everything starting with Z all the way down. If I click it again, we start with where we don't have a city, but eventually you'll get to the A's and the B's and so on. So let's look at one. Uh, we're all familiar with. So if I type in House Street, the House Street disposal site comes up. I could have searched by address. I could have searched by the facility ID. I could have 
typed in Kent County and looked through all the Kent County sites to try to find it. Then you scroll over to the right and just a, a tip, if you have a mouse with a scroll wheel like I do and you hold down shift, it'll scroll back and forth instead of up and down. So it's a little easier to get to the left here. If you don't have that, sometimes you might have to scroll down and move the scroll bar like this. Okay. You select the ellipses. And what do we know about this site? Well, we know we've got some contaminants here, lead, PFAS, obviously. And we have files, 5,960 files all in electronic format, all available for you to look at right now. I can sort them by date. We have files all the way back to 1964. I turn it like this. We have one yet from this month. If I expand this, it's not gonna tell you much. It's gonna tell you kind of the basics that you already know. We're hoping to put, the only purpose for this is if the, a single document affects multiple locations, you'd be able to see multiple locations here. Most of the documents are only associated with this particular site, so it only shows that site. So the ellipses on this line don't matter as much, but the print button does, or the little view button here. If we click that, this data isn't stored in RIDE, it's stored in something called Content Manager. That's where we house all of our electronic files and that's where they're doing all this scanning and they're putting them in, putting them in, putting them in. They put those in Content Manager. So every time we click that, the system makes a call to the Content Manager and retrieves the data and brings it back. So here's an email from, what, last week that was scanned in and put in our system. If we go back and want to look at the work plan, <laughs> work plan from 1964. I don't know if they have work plans back then, but let's see what it is. You can click on this. And we've got this document from 1964 that you can look at for fun and see what they were doing in 1964 in terms of environmental work. So it's kind of cool. Um, it puts everything kind of all, the goal is to put everything all in one spot and open up transparency so people don't have to pay money or go through the burden, burdensome process of trying to do a FOIA request. We just throw it all out there for people to get anytime they want. Um, you can download these, so if I clicked on this and it pulls the document up, what it should do, I don't know how everyone's system works, but what it does for mine is it pulls it up in a browser window and I can then download it from there. Sometimes you get an error message when doing that, sometimes you don't. If you do get an error message, you can do the print and you can print it as a PDF if you want, if, if that's preferred. Either way, you can save it. Um, what I tell people is though, there's not really a need to save it. This is your library. It's all right here. Anytime you want to look at it, you go here. You don't have to save that on your local computer. Um, hey, Dave, is there a way yeah. for someone who might be going through all 5,000 documents and says, OK, I want 30 of these pages. Is there a way for them to bookmark them or uh, save them for future reference or to um, perhaps download them all at once? Is there a way to do batches? We're working on it. So um, one okay. of the things that we've gotten from our FOIA Central office for Eagle FOIA Central is they've said they want RIDE to have that capability. So what we'll have is um, sooner or later, we'll have a different spot that's like called something like the download portal or file download portal and that'll be another button here probably it'll be another button here on the left and that would allow you to select a bunch of files and we do something called zipping them up maybe you've heard of zip files 
when you're dealing with a lot of data, you can zip them up and move it around electronically a little easier. So we'll have that, Abby, uh, at, at some point. Um, hmm. uh, right now, you go one by one. There's no way to bookmark it. It's not really remembering you as because you, you're not logged in as a user. You scroll up to the top, it just says public user up here. So it's not remembering you as a user at this point. Um, and we don't have a way to bookmark it anyway. So in those cases, you might want to download them one at a time and, and keep them wherever you want to keep them. Um, again, we're in the same we're in the same kind of system, right? So we've got columns and rows. If we want to add columns, we can do that. So we can see district, we can see county. Um, you can also type. So maybe I only am interested in correspondence that filters everything down by that particular file type. So instead of 5,000 files, I've got well, 4,059. <laughs> so a lot of them are <laughs> correspondence. Um, but if maybe I'm more interested in, you know, I don't care about the correspondence. It's a lot of emails going back and forth. Maybe I'm more interested in um, remediation investigation. So I just type mediation. And now I'm seeing, OK, now I'm looking at monitoring reports and I'm down to 1736 that I've got to wade through. So I'm going to sort it by date using this because I know that my report that I'm looking for was in 2022. So now I can look for that. And maybe I I can even type that in. Maybe I want one from 2022. So it won't do that, but it'll do a specific date if you have the specific date. Oh, one. I don't know if there's a document here. Oh, two. 2022. No results. So what do I do? OK, shucks. Clear the filters. Now I'm back to where I started. I can look for one from 1 to 2024. And that pulls up the single document we've got that's dated by that. So different ways to do it, different ways to search. Again, think of it like an Excel table. You've got columns, you've got rows. You can sort using the arrows and you can filter using um, you know, these, these searches under the columns. So that was kind of fast, probably for some people. I'll pause and take a moment to see if there's any questions. John, John, if you're talking, you're muted. John, you're still muted. I'll let Connie ask her question and then we'll go to John. How is that? Sure. Connie, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, see that when you pulled up some of these documents, they say redacted. So is mm -hmm. the information really useful if you're redacting a lot of the key points in a in a report? You're right. So redactions are um, we redact based on what's called personally identifiable information or PII. And we're obligated by law to do that. Every public agency is. So if we have a document that contains someone's email address, for example, someone's private email address. So maybe one of you emailed a project manager with a concern or a question, um, but you probably didn't expect that that email would be distributed to the whole world. Um, we redact that out. Um, and that's even if you did a Freedom of Information Act request, you would still get redacted documents. It's how we have to, by law, provide them. Um, it's certainly not a lot of key information. It's only the personally identifiable information. It, we're not allowed to um, really choose what we redact. So if, if someone put in a report that was really damaging to Eagle or the department, we have 
no option to just redact that information. That's still all public. It, it's only what's personally identifiable. <clears throat> Names, addresses, check numbers, bank account numbers, those kinds of things. Great, thank you. Uh, John. Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Yep, got it. Great. Um, is the data accessible only via filters? Like, for instance, or can I type in the name of a facility? If I'm doing a facility search, like sure. my favorite pitch landfill right down the road, um, okay. how would I go about doing that? So we're back now. We're back at the main inventory of facilities page. We cleared our filters, so we shouldn't have yep. anything yep. filtered out. We can confirm that by looking down at the bottom. Yeah, we've got 28,000 locations here, so that's about right. And what'd you say, pitch landfill? Yeah, in building. Let's look for pitch. Yeah, it's a P I T. Yeah, yeah. P I T C H. S C H. Yeah, yeah, I think so. S C H. Well, S yeah, P I T S C H. That's it. Yeah. P I T S C H. P I T S C H. Yeah. I don't have anything for that. Oh. Have you got an address? Yes, Johnson Road. It's 3270, I think. Um, oh gosh, I just had it here a minute ago. Where did it go? Um, it should show up if you. S yeah, gosh. Sorry. I just don't have it memorized. <laughs> It, it's, it's Johnson and Dave, Kidville Road is where it is. Yeah. Dave, it's 7905 Johnson. Ah, thank you. It's oh, promising. You know, everything. Okay. So that's a good, what you just saw was a good example of sometimes less is more when you're searching. Yeah. So I okay. typed in, let's go back here. I typed in pitch landfill no matches that's because it's yeah. called pitch sanitary landfill that's right now it it is matching so sometimes you might just say okay i'm just going to type pitch and see what happens oh, here and i've got okay. okay i got a bunch of sites on pitcher street that's not really what i'm looking for but if i keep scrolling i find it it only returned 15 locations with pitch in the name so yeah we can okay. find it Yep, and then if and I'm if looking at, uh, over, yeah, yeah, go to the, yeah, exactly. Go to the yeah. files. Right now there's zero. So what that means oh, is okay. that this is a site that they haven't scanned in files for yet. Okay. So mm -hmm. If we open that up, it says, okay, if you aren't seeing what you were hoping to see, you can do a Freedom of Information Act request. When we do that, if you wanted the whole site file for pitch landfill, they would scan in the whole thing, send it to you, and then all those documents would be in the system and available for everyone after you. Very good. Dave, Excellent. how would they tell if that was an MMD site versus an RRD site? Or any well, of the MMD? This, this, if it's a 201 site, then we have it on the list. If it's not a 201 site, we don't have it on the list. So I don't have we don't have anything that says the whether it's regulated by two divisions, MMD and RRD. Um, if it's on here, it's got a 201 obligation. So maybe we've allowed MMD to be the managing agency, but it's still a 201 location. So maybe you can explain that to, to everyone about the fact that um, uh, our, our regulated landfills that are still on operating wouldn't necessarily be in this database. Correct. correct. If correct. So that would. The regulated landfills are managed under the materials management division, um, and I'm not familiar with what they have in terms of a counterpart for this system. Um, you know, we you could dig into that and see what they have. Maybe they're a little further behind than we are. 
um, and it might be reaching out to the project manager, or the district office to see what they could, what information they could provide. Mm -hmm. So at least for all the land, uh, some of the landfills are not going to be in here. Some of these, these are going to be older landfills that usually are not operating that will be in this particular system. The operating landfills will still be managed by MMD and won't necessarily be in this database. So just because it doesn't show up here doesn't mean that there isn't something within uh -huh. EGLE, but just know that this is kind of a subset of the overall EGLE um, universe. Thank you for that. That's good. Mm -hmm. Correct. What is it, Abby? I think it's like once a landfill is closed, there's like <laughs> 35 years or something that goes by and then it gets transferred to remediation redevelopment division. Yeah. Yeah, they have ongoing obligations, I think, for 30 years, and then it comes over years. to uh, once the post closure period's done, then it comes over to um, RRD. So, wow. Lynn's got her hand up. Yeah. Lynn, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I think you can hear me, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, I did go downstairs for a moment, David. And by the way, David, it's nice to see you here. David, nice, was, nice to hear you. Yeah, was, he was a big help here in, in Rockford on another site. And it was rewarding to me because I could see that he also genuinely cared about his work as well as being good at it. Um, that Thank being you. said, well, um, do these, I, and if I missed it, I'm sorry, but do these documents include violations? Um, if, we, if, if we sent a violation notice, and it's mm -hmm. been scanned and is in our system, yes, that mm -hmm. would be included. Okay, and if not, then you could miss it, right? But it won't include the, the water resource violation notice letters. Those will be in the My Environment, or in that's the right. My Enviro portal and, and system. Right, and that's what I kind of wanted to point out to John and others. You know, I, I've picked up a few things over time, but you really have to hit every department to get Division. a thorough yeah. sense of it because um, when we were uh, studying Wolverine in that whole chapter, you know, it was it was significant to discover the violations. And we, you know, we did air, we did water. And then when you get to our um, MM, MMD, mm -hmm. um, I just point this out like to, to others that are new to this. Like, you know, it used to be called hazardous waste, which really made sense. <laughs> you, when they changed it to MMD, Materials Management Division, it's like, what? It, that would just go right by the typical person. But mm -hmm. that's very important to know whether or not these landfills have had violations and whether they've cooperated with them. Wolverine had extensive violation notices and they, they are very revealing. So, um, and then, uh, you know, for, for John as well and others, there's a whole different apartment then and rules and regulations for wetlands. Um, and then this comes back to the whole multimedia approach then to the people in the wetlands division, aside from amounts of water or, or the, you know, the, the fact that it might be, be filled in, the, the fact that contamination might be seeping into the water that's come, you know, that whole interaction. So it is complex. And yeah. Um, so that's why I asked you, David, just because as you're updating it, you still have to kind of do a search in all these different departments, correct? To understand one site in a way. Yeah, and, and I can speak to that a little bit. There is okay. there is an effort um to break down the silos and pull things together. Um, so it's like more of a GIS map based system. Mm -hmm. And what they want to do is call it Eagle interests so that you could zoom into a site and see um, what divisions have touched that particular piece of property, right? So if yeah. air quality's touched it, if water's touched it, if um, MMD has touched it, we've touched it you know you'd be able to see and then be directed to these individual systems because these individual systems are important our our needs and our workflow is completely different from water resources 
And so exactly. we need to build our own system to do what we need it to do. We can't right. we can't have a common system for everything. But the idea would be as if there was a place you could go um, where you could see all of the eagle interests, then be directed from there. Um, that would be helpful to to what you're talking about. I don't know what the timeline of that is. I know it's complicated um, mm -hmm. when you're talking about trying to put something like that together. Um, but it it's something that the department as a whole is is aware of and thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Appreciate it. That's great. Thank you, uh, Joe, and then John. Uh, I'm impressed. Uh, you studied the uh, this kind of uh, uh, digital uh, transformation. Um, uh, I thank you for doing it. Uh, my question is simple: How long <clears throat> will it take before you'll be done? <laughs> uh, That's the simple question, Joe. <laughs> uh, yes, it's, it, it sounds like a simple question. Next um, year I've, or longer? Um, it'll be longer than a couple years. Um, hopefully, it'll be less than 15 years, 10 or 15 years. I, I'm hoping that we would be through a lot of it by then. Um, it, it's hard to determine because for a lot of the older sites, you know, the district offices were literally exploding with paper. I say literally, figuratively exploding with paper. And so we have a facility called Record Center that they were shipping boxes and boxes of files to. And I don't know how many boxes are in the Record Center that we need to scan. Um, and it's a little outside of, of what I do. A, a, a different group in RRD is sort of managing that project. And if I, if I ask them, maybe they have a goal date to be done, um, but if they do, I don't. I don't know it. I mean, this is going to be a tr tremendous amount of uh, work. Yeah. You know, yeah. For, for years and years of the record, and uh, there are some mm -hmm. legal things tied up too. So. Anyway, wish yep. your luck and hope we can get it done <laughs> soon. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. There's every for every document, a person has to touch it. They need to go through it and they need to look for that personally identifiable information, names, addresses, numbers. And for, first they have to scan it, then they have to redact it, then they have to put it in the system and you know, I think we have somewhere around 50 people doing that. They put in over a thousand documents every day. So it's um, and you can imagine what that costs to hire 30, 40 contractors. So it's clearly a focus of the division. It's a priority. We're spending a lot of the funds that we get on that project to try to get it done as quick as we can. Um, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Now, Abby, um, you could send us on a retreat to like Mackinac Island and we could all take a box and <laughs> give us some pizza and a little beer and fill that up. I mean, I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking outside yes. the box here. But, you, know. you would be in the box before the weekend was done, Connie, or uh, Sandy, because you would not be happy with us. Yeah, I lived among those boxes in the district office for many, many years, uh, watching them all going, oh my gosh, we're never going to be done. Yeah. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is this is just the information for RRD. And RRD gets how many BEAs every year, Dave? 6,000? Oh, no, about 1,200. About 1,200 a year? A yeah, about 300 a quarter, okay. 1,200 a year. So we're getting new sites added on to this and or new information that come in every year. And then we still have, you know, all of the records for all the old landfills that are in MMD and water resources has got a lot of their stuff digitized. But I think some of the other divisions still have other things to go. So um, as a department, we've still got a long ways to go. But 
are already making some really big headway towards us. So, and this information, if we can get it all online for the documents to actually be there for you guys to be accessible, I mean, that would be huge. So I have yeah, one more request, but I'm gonna let John ask his question first. Well, this this might not, might be out of out of order. I was just wondering, you know, in, in response to the fact that all of this data is still kind of in silos and it's eventually going to get integrated in some manner. <clears throat> How does someone like myself, who doesn't have the familiarity with the locations and all the divisions and how they interact together, uh, where does one go, you know, to uh, you know gain some understanding of how this process works? Um, well, one place you could go is um, if you were in Ride, you could we'll go to the home screen, okay. and you could go to the Freedom of Information Act site, and this will walk you through. This is um, somewhat unsiloed, and I haven't really been uh, through this process I very have, well. I have. Okay, so I think you can request information about a site from any and all divisions. So if you okay. had a specific location in mind, a specific pitch landfill in mind, yeah. and you did a request, you could request it for all the divisions and get all of their information that they have for that particular site. And that might help you learn, you know, if you get if you get 99 documents from materials management division and one document from air quality, you can say, okay, this is probably, you know, pretty much in their court and I'm gonna reach gotcha. out to that project manager. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's good. Yeah. But that's what Dave was just talking about, um, John, is, is trying to have a, a portal where you could see all of those things from one um, one GIS map. You could pick it out on the map and say, OK, uh, what about that site? What are all the divisions that ha would have files on that particular site? And so that it'll be a lot easier in the future. But it's it's okay. not quite done yet. Um, yeah, we're, so yeah. I'm going to yep. go I'm going to drop this link in the chat as well. Um, because you'll see here when I scroll down, okay, here's our system. We've got environmental mapper, we've got ride. Here's materials management division system. So you can click on that. I haven't been here. Well, I, I guess I have a long time ago, but you know, I'm not the person to describe this, but this is their system of how you search for their stuff. Um, if we're more interested in Air quality, you know, maybe they've got some stuff you could look at. Well, logic system. Mm -hmm. So there, you, you can at least see what the divisions have in terms of distributing their information. Okay. So, Dave, I think one of the other things that would be really helpful for this group before we let you go is can you show them how to do a search for, say, oh. um, everything in Iosco County or something along those lines so they could look at it a, a county and then maybe export um, the findings because I noticed there's an export button and sure. so again we're going to go back we're going to go back to the inventory of facilities we have county as a column right now if we didn't have it we could add it Maybe you're interested in a particular Senator House district, whatever. Um, let's look at a smaller county, let's look at like Alger. So this has 52 sites of either 201s or 213 sites. So that if you live in Alger County, that's your list, 52. You can go up here to this export button and you can click that. takes a minute for that to load. Now in my downloads, it's downloaded a table. And so now this, it's it's like it's Excel. It's not an XLS document. It's like a CBS document, but anyway, they operate similarly. But here's those 52 and you've got all the columns. So you, even though we didn't add Senate District to the lit, 
the column in ride, it still has it here. You've got all the columns. You've got all the sites for that particular county. You could narrow it down further. Um, you could say, OK, I'm going to look in Alger County, but I only want to look in Munising. So now my list is 19. Nice. I can export that or I, you know, if you you can export it if you want it in Excel. The downside of that is, you know, you're not. You're not getting anything with that. You don't get the drop downs where you can look at the files. You've just got a list. Mm -hmm. um, but if we go back here, you know, that's not that many sites to look for. You scroll through. Oh, yeah, Lake State Wood Preserving. That's the one I want. I'm going to look at that 380 files. And now I'm going to try to find whatever it is I'm looking for. Is it possible to um, to uh, add a contaminant of concern to that um, list at the top so that you can just look for those that are PFAS sites in Munising or no? Um, it's possible for us as a database developer to add it as a column. I'm reticent to do it because it's only as good as the data that's in our system. And True. I don't, you know, you're going to have a lot of sites. PFAS we're pretty good about because that's newer on the contaminant list, but you're going to have a lot of sites that might have, you know, chlorinated volatile organic chemicals that if you searched by that, and in the database that field was blank it wouldn't show up mm. and so it okay. would be misleading data you might have you know 5,000 sites with those kinds of contaminants and your list would show 500 and you'd say oh, i don't see my site and, and so mm -hmm. for that kind of data I, I tend not to want to put it up here because it it would it would fool people into thinking that you did, you're you, you're getting what you asked for and you're not Um, Lynn, is your hand up again or are you just exercising? <laughs> no, no, my hand is up again. Um, I just take it away, Lynn. Thank you. Um, just talk to David about this too. I, I know that sometimes I don't know if this is your background or not, David, and it's, you know, but I think that often sometimes people come into the Eagle after they've worked as an environmental consultant. And I, I think that some of us who are just getting into this and realize the complexity of it, I don't think it hurts to, to pay the money to hire an environmental consultant to go through it with you. And, and Correct. Uh, I think that would be, is enormously helpful. I, we, we needed that at a certain point because it is so complex. That's all. Yep, I spent... Uh... 10 years in the private sector and thought I knew what I was doing. And then I came to Eagle and was learned a lot. So there's a, uh, we're always on a learning curve, even right. the people who make a career out of it. Right. So that's just a thought to put out there for those of us who aren't scientists. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for um, showing us this. This is really impressive. I mean, and, and I think we've talked a lot about, um, the, the whole FOIA issue and the cost. And so taking steps like this for transparency really goes a long way. It's 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 really good. And yes, it will take a little time. But again, I'm just throwing out the retreat idea. Mackin Island or a beach house. <laughs> just saying. You got a I'm lot into that as, as long as Abby's paying for it. I'm into that. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a big budget. We're all going to be intense. <laughs> with some Dixie cups and okay. our marshmallows around the campfire. So yeah, bring your own marshmallows. Great. Yeah, okay. bring your own marshmallows. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for showing us that and teaching us all that. That's a good resource to have. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. There's a uh, last thing I'll say on that web page that I shared. There's an email box. Um, I think it's called Ride Help or Ride Administration, something like that. Um, and those come to me and a few other people. So if you have any questions about using it um, or you're getting confused, you thought something should be there and it's not, 
um, feel free to shoot that email box a message and someone will respond. So thank you. Well, before very much. you go, my, my name is Tamara Looks and I'm on the phone. I'm not on the actual presentation. I did have a quick question. I'm not sure if you covered it because I joined a few minutes late, but um, regarding the information that is getting added or amended, how fast is something going to be reflected on the website when you have a change in, in a property or, or something? Okay, yeah, so um, it depends a little bit from district to district, but essentially what we try to do is um, anything new um, that comes in the door, we're trying to scan that immediately, get it into the system, and it's actually how a, a lot of our information gets transmitted to the, even the project manager is it gets scanned into the system and then they get a link to the scan file. Um, so the new stuff should be pretty quick within a few days after the department receives it. Um, for the old stuff, you know, it's just, you know, essentially when the work crew gets to it or if something is FOIA, then that's prioritized to digitize. And so that's how that stuff gets through. But the new stuff should be coming through pretty quickly. Thank you. You're welcome. Glad you made it. All right. Um, let's move on to subcommittee reports. I dare the website review committee to want to follow up after that, but because that's quite a website, but uh, there's been some cool changes on the MPART website. So is anybody here from the website review committee? Uh, yeah. Go. Yep, that's Brad Benman. <clears throat> If you can hear me, um, yep. we uh, I think we, uh, sent, we sent out news and you uh, forwarded it to everybody. The the fact that the uh, um, residential launch page or the les resident or, or resources for residents is is now live. And uh, Kelly just put it up on the screen to kind of give a picture of what it is. But uh, it made the, uh, the the new format added some some information, uh, clarified some information, um, and I think. Uh, <clears throat> I think we're going to have some more discussion about it later, so I don't want to talk about it very long, but I just wanted you to see what we were looking at. Um, and uh, uh, if you have a, a meeting coming up or you have meet, uh, discussions with some of your members or local residents that you're dealing with, if you could uh, you know, share this with them. Um, and I think uh, Kelly and our committee would also, a subcommittee would also be interested in any uh, suggestions for improvements that uh, that you have, and we can talk about those and see if some of those can be incorporated. So that'll be it. Great. Looks good. I was on there buzzing around the other day, so I was impressed. Lots of stuff on there. Lots and lots of resources. So, um, all right. Any questions for Brad or anything about the website or feedback? <clears throat> All right, uh, next is the prevention subcommittee. Dave, yeah, I think that's yours. I have nothing to add at this point. OK. Um, one thing that kind of goes with this, I was actually on a phone call today with Keen Shoes, the shoe company, and they have um, really worked hard at making their shoes PFAS free, and they have a whole resource section about that, as okay. well as a guide that they will give to other companies to get PFAS out of their products and move to PFAS free. So um, can you forward it to me? Andy? Yeah, I will send that link over to you. It was a pretty impressive phone call and they're really um, interested in this. So excellent. Um, Thank yeah. you. Can you All copy right. us on that as well, uh, Sandy? Yep. Yep. I'll send it out to everybody. How is that? Thank you. Or I can drop it in the chat if that's easier. Um, how about the engaging the public subcommittee? Not sure who leads that one right now, if anyone. Um, this is Mary. I can report on everything. Um, okay. We spend most of the time talking about the Eat Safe Fish program and how to get the word out to communities. And Rick shared that during the uh, website review committee, they were also uh, discussing that to a certain extent. Um, Rick suggested like a one page sheet with general um, state guidelines on it for fish limits and Kelly was able to bring up on the computer 
a copy of a brochure that I had received from MDHHS. Um, and so I'm not sure, uh, I'm gonna try and scan that and send it to Rick as well. Um, so he can see if that fits what he was thinking. Um, we also looked at uh, computer information on the uh, Eat Safe Fish Guide and saw how some lakes have uh, mercury listed but not PFOS even when they qualify for PFOS and other lakes have listed for um, mercury, PFOS and even uh, PCBs. So we were wondering uh, if this is based on the level of contamination and why it would be listed for some lakes for PFOS and other lakes not listed. So that's one question. Um, the other thing uh, Connie had brought up um, in Wayne County that Eagle spends a lot of time identifying uh, PFAS sites, but not as much time in actually cleaning up sites. And her other concern was getting back to a polluter pay uh, situation. And I think the legislature is starting to work on that. But she thinks that that is two big initiatives uh, that should be worked on. And uh, another thing that was discussed was uh, lead pipes. Uh, Connie was concerned that we might be trading one contaminant, <clears throat> excuse me, one contaminant for another because some places are replacing lead pipes with flexible pipe and PVC and that those also could be uh, bringing contaminants in. Um, Rick did share too that um, some lines from the road to the house in Rockford were being replaced with copper lines. And uh, so that was more helpful. Anybody else from the engaging the public subcommittee meeting have anything else to add? I no. guess that's it. So should we try to answer those questions you brought up, Mary, or are we just, I never know what to do because those are really good questions. But we yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, maybe we could even discuss it later <laughs> okay. when we get to the okay. bottom of the page. Oh, Marcus it looks like his hand uh, up, Marcus I bet is, it's about the fish issue. Yeah. Good. Good, good okay. guess on that. Um, yeah, so what, when it comes to the fish, so we test for several different contaminants. Um, we list the contaminant that drives the most restrictive consumption guideline. So if it's mercury and PFOS and they both, let's say, do four meals per month, then we would have both of them listed. If mercury is two, PFOS is four, then we list mercury as the driving contaminant. So when we get new fish data, if uh, let's say we didn't test for PFOS the last time we tested, this time we test for PFOS, and that is more restrictive than the existing guideline, then we would replace the previous contaminant with PFOS. So that's why even though we have PFOS data for some lakes, you're not going to see it on the guideline because that's not the one driving the consumption level. Okay. Uh, on the rec sheet, so if you go to the science uh, part of the Eat Safe Fish website, um, you can access the recommendation sheets there, and that will show you all the different contaminants and the levels and what that would um, what that contaminant would show for a guideline as well. So if it's tested for PFOS, that is available on the web and you can see what consumption category PFOS would be driving. Does that help, Mary? Yeah, so is, sorry, Marcus, is, is that yeah, in the no, mind micro or is that a different site? Uh, Kelly, are, uh, it's on the, so on the Eat Safe Fish um, website. Okay. Um, you go to science and reports. So Kelly, if you can go to, there you go. Kelly's got uh, this, man. She does, uh, down on the bottom right. Sorry, it's reports and science. Um, no, I'm sorry, Kelly, go to the little uh, microscopy icon. Yep, click on that. And then um, those are the recommendation sheets right there. So if you just pick, uh, so go right where you are, click like, doesn't matter which one, click Southeast do, that's fine. Um, these are all the recommendation sheets. So if you just scroll down, you can see this is a roughly 500 page document. It shows Big Seven Lake. That's the information for largemouth bass. Um, if you keep scrolling, it goes through all the different 
Bryce Lake, Holly, Ta- Holly Township. There you go. So that's bluegill. You see it at the top of the rec sheet. It shows the mercury analysis that was done, which is driving a meal category of four. Uh, if you scroll down, you see that it has PFOS tested, and you can see the years on that, 2021 um, PFOS at 7.3 parts per billion. Mean, we used the 95th percentile upper confidence limit to be more conservative, so we used the 9.4 value, and that drives a meal category of 12. So in this case, mercury is more restrictive than PFOS based on the amount of mercury we found in the bluegill in that lake. So that's why we would have mercury down on that one. Great. Yeah. Thanks. And these these sheets are great. They'll show you. And they uh, notice, too, I want to show you, it, it says range of years used earliest to most recent. You'll see some of the fish, some of these water bodies have been tested for several times. So you'll see several years listed there. Um, and generally speaking, we take all years into account. Um, takes a few years of data before we actually relax a guideline. So if we test some fish and they come out to be um, less contaminated, um, it takes a couple samples before we're going to truly relax it. We want to make sure that just wasn't a weird sample that we got or something that's aberrant to what we normally would get. Uh, yeah, and you can see the different plotting of the size of the fish there, and then uh, mercury and, and some of the other contaminants will run a size regression on it sometimes to see if um, there needs to be a length break when it comes to the contamination as well of the fish. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Rick, you, Rick's got his hand up, and then Connie. Yeah, I just wanted to say that one of the things that was driving my uh, my response or my questions on this was that um, <clears throat> some people that are, uh, I guess, older in years like myself are a little bit cavalier about um, eating fish because with mercury, um, you know, our central nervous system is developed and it doesn't have the same hazard. But um, oh. not that I believe that, but there's a lot of people that... <laughs> that say that. Um, I'm a little concerned though that, you know, PFOS is, is a different type of toxicant and it doesn't, um, you know, it's not a central nervous system toxicant. So, you know, somebody my age would be maybe concerned about consuming PFOS because of cholesterol or, you know, other types of, of endpoints. So um, I was just kind of looking for a way to, um, or just a, a thought that um, we should be looking at better ways to uh, or, or a different way to cl- uh, to communicate uh, fish consumption and there, there's just so much there uh, that it's hard for somebody not to have their eyes glazed over looking at all that information and I I was thinking that the uh, the statewide advisory is something that everybody should be aware of because that's the basis for um, the whole eat safe fish program and I know you know, you can have differences among individual lakes, but just to reemphasize that, I think would be good because um, at least some of the articles that are coming out in the newspaper, people say they don't know about, you know, the fish contamination, but all of our lakes and rivers have, a, there's a statewide advisory, which is that one little page. And I just think we need to emphasize that a little bit more, just so people realize that um, there are contaminants in fish and, you know, something like, for like lake perch, it's four meals um, a month, um, but we, we should be looking at restricting um, consumption of, of fish at a minimum based on that statewide guideline. And I think people just get lost in the complexity of the, of that you know very thick book and all the different advisories. And I, I think if we just started emphasizing that statewide advisory, there wouldn't be a question on whether you know a fish is safe or not because. Um, they're all have limits on consumption based on mercury typically. So, yeah, yeah you make you make a, a very good point. I, I love hearing that. And as you saw, that was I think what was it Southeast two or something that Kelly clicked on, and that was 500 pages long. So we're talking you know thousands of these recommendation sheets if you yeah. actually wanted to dive into the science behind it. And you know one of the questions that comes up is is you know to be notified when there's a consumption guideline or or advisory on a water body, well, you'd make a good point. Every water body in Michigan has a consumption advisory out there. It's a statewide advisory. So even if you don't find your body of water in the Eat Safe Fish Guides, there's still, uh, you know, recommendations on how much you should be eating because unfortunately, you know, mercury is everywhere and and mm-hmm. we see it statewide. Um, and, and, you know, it's one of those things that just mercury just is a very persistent uh, contaminant as well. 
Um, so I, I love hearing you say that. That is something that we can definitely focus on is just advertising that just because you didn't find your water body doesn't mean you can go eat infinite numbers of fish. There's still mercury out there for uh, the population. And then, you know, as you said, with contaminants too, um, that is also why we have these rec sheets up there. So if you're concerned about specific contaminants, you can look for them. Otherwise, what we're trying to do is obviously address the most sensitive population. So it tends to be, you know, developing children, fetuses, pregnant women. Um, those are the ones that we want to make sure we're protective of that um, part of our, our population of our communities. Yeah. No, I was uh, discussing with a fellow uh, PhD about, you know, being too old to be worrying about central nervous system toxicity. And I said, you know, PFAS is totally different. You know, we're not necessarily worried about uh, the same things that we're worried about with mercury or lead. So um, I think that's a message that needs to get out because a lot of people, you know, scuff that off if they're old, if they're older and they don't have children or something like that. So um, I just think we need to look at that advisory and, and, you know, emphasize that more, so. That's a good point, Rick. I remember playing mm -hmm. with mercury as a kid, right? In the third oh, yeah. and stuff, yeah. Yep, I had um, a jar in my basement, so. Yes, we all did, right. Uh, okay, Connie, we won't stay on the way back machine here. Go ahead, Connie. Yeah, it's a real quick question. Uh, what I need to know is, does mercury concentrate in the same area as PFAS does in a fish? Hmm. Yeah, mercury. Um, so you saw the the handout with the three C's um, that does not apply to mercury or PFOS. So uh, you cannot rid your fish of mercury by draining off the fat and cutting around the fatty portions, grilling it. Um, so sometimes if the driver is not mercury or PFOS, you can double the serving size if you cook it properly or, or in a way that will allow the fat to drip off like we see with PCBs. Um, but mercury and um, PFOS, you cannot rid your fish by cooking it that way. So it is in the muscle tissue. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Can I ask um, you one quick question since you're talking about eating fish? The already <laughs> skin of a fish versus the 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 meat of fish is there one more concentrated than the other part i wouldn't be able to answer that question um given that i'm not a fish biologist but what i could say is when we analyze the fish their skinless fillets is what we're analyzing for contaminants so we are not analyzing skin on other than some species like smelt where we do headless gutted so it's the entire fish. Usually it's just the, um, what we consider the edible portion, which is the skinless filet coming off that fish. And the, the, the reason I was asking that question was in Europe, you see people eating the fish, including the skin a lot. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. wondering whether one does uh, make sense or or not i don't know if we if we have much research on the skin itself i know when we've <clears> looked <throat> at whole fish analysis with the head the guts all of it that and i'm gonna look at marcus here i'm guessing the the what we see compared to a fillet is about um two to three know, times higher two to three um, times higher yeah. for a whole fish versus the fillet so and I, I just think know it's that because I just got off a phone call with Eagle. <laughs> yeah. Talking about the same thing. Um, yeah, and and no, I I sorry, I I enjoy eating the skin of a fish too. Uh, but it's it's generally speaking, you know, it, it probably there's a lot of fatty tissue um, between the skin and and the the meat itself. Um, so and fatty tissue generally accumulates things like the PCBs, not so much the PFOS or the mercury. So I think it would depend on which contaminant you're talking about, whether that skin would make a difference or not. Um, Again, moderation key, right, on all this stuff. Uh, you know, I, I still enjoy eating it from time to time, so that's that's the good thing. You know, taste I'm hungry for fish. I don't know. Now I want fish for dinner. <laughs> there you go. Well, thanks for jumping in there, Marcus. I can always count on you to give us the answers on fish. Um, all right, and I am going to make note about the questions that were brought up about we're good at finding things, but we don't have a lot of cleanup. Mm -hmm. 
and um, the question of lead line replacement and stuff so that we can address that at another meeting. How does that sound? I'll put that kind of in a parking lot. Um, Mary, uh, anything on membership committee? You know, we we did not meet. Um, okay. But we, for the members, we did um, send out uh, the concept document that we had circulated uh, last year um, before we started back in on the notification document. Uh, when we had our member only meetings, um, this was brought up as something to continue working on. So if there's anybody who is interested in participating in that, we would welcome your uh, input um, either by email or to let you know when we're going to be meeting. Um, and Connie, or um, I'm sorry, Sandy had even suggested that uh, possibly we need to change the name of this document so it's clearer as to what the uh, purpose is of it. So um, I think we will be discussing in a few minutes um, other issues with the COG. And so maybe that will be uh, one thing is to uh, when we're going to have the next member meeting and move on from there. Thank you. All right. Uh, Abby, any updates? Um, yeah, we do have a couple things that I wanted to uh, note for you. Um, Kelly's going to bring up the website so we can just talk about the new sites that have been added in the last, um, well, I guess it's been two months since we've talked. So we've had Christmas and um, a few sites added in there. So we did add uh, container specialties in Genesee County that had pretty low levels, not a big uh, impact to drinking water, which was fantastic. We added the resource for residents page, which I'm glad that the website review committee got to take got a chance to look at. I really encourage everybody to take a look at that and let us know if you see any ideas for improvements or anything else that you think would be great to add. Um, and or if you've got other resources on other PFAS free products, uh, that would be great for us to keep track of. So Colmac in Wayne County was added, um, Copper Harbor Landfill in Keweenaw, and then the Lowell City Landfill in Ionia County were all added in the last um, little bit. The other thing I will add is um, the interim biosolids strategy was updated again for 2024. So we'll in the um, you will recall from the previous uh, time that uh, people were on to talk about biosolids, uh, the strategy had been for any concentrations of PFOS. Now it's going to be any concentrations of PFS, PFOS or PFOA. Um, that we'll be looking at both of those contaminants and lowering the threshold from 125 down to 100 and anything over um, anything over 100 just doesn't get land applied at all. Anything over 20 parts per billion can only be land applied at half the normal agronomic rate in all facilities um, participating in biosolids application has to do yearly testing. So um, that officially started January 1st. All the facilities, you know, knew this was coming and I don't think it'll be a big surprise, uh, but it definitely helps, has helped um, drive source control for the wastewater treatment plants and has been a big benefit. So that's something that no other part of the country has. Um, so we're pretty, pretty proud of that work. The other thing that I will just mention is Eagle, um, was awarded uh, from EPA. There was a, a small and disadvantaged community grant specifically for emerging contaminants that um, EPA had a uh, quite a big chunk of money. E Eagle was awarded uh, $37.3 million for that. Um, it's gonna go to several projects in and around um, the state that will connect municipal water to homes that have been impacted by PFAS. So we're excited about that. Um, but it will also help, uh, MPART's got a, a small chunk of that to look at some homes in disadvantaged communities where um, 
they're not hooked up to municipal water, but they could be hooked up and we think that they might be at risk. So we're going to be looking at a couple different communities to evaluate those potential risks with this money. Um, so there should be a press release coming out on this and we'll highlight it in another meeting um, when that actually comes out. But we just found out about this. So obviously it's a, you know, it's some additional infrastructure money that um, we're going to try to use as much of it as we can uh, that comes out of the federal government and make sure that um, Michigan residents are taken care of. So the other thing I will just mention is that we are eagerly anticipating um, EPA's um, uh, addition of the uh, drinking water values for their maximum contaminant levels, their MCLs. So you will recall that EPA proposed dropping, well, putting out drinking water values of four parts per billion for PFOS, four parts per billion for PFOA, and then a hazard index for four other PFAS. Um, and so that would set drinking water standards for the entire country, which would be huge considering most of the rest of the country is not even close to where we are for doing drinking water evaluations. Does not apply to private drinking water wells, but to municipal public water supplies. So um, anticipating that right now, end of February, beginning of March is what we think will happen on uh, when that will actually come out. So that will be very big news when it does. Other thing we're keeping a close eye on, um, all of these packages are in with EPA's Office of Management and Budget, um, OMB they call it. They, um, the drinking water, the MCL package, they also have a CERCLA uh, package in to make PFOS and PFOA hazardous substances under CERCLA, which would allow them to um, uh, EPA to use Superfund monies specifically for PFAS cleanups, which would be huge. And um, to talk about um, RICRA, nominating it as a hazardous constituent, not a hazardous waste, but a hazardous constituent, which would allow, um, again, the people participating in the RICRA program to um, be able to uh, analyze for PFAS under their corrective action programs. So uh, those are the hazardous waste sites um, that are a smaller subset of our of our state facilities under the materials management division. Um, but those things are all in with uh, EPA's Office of Management and Budget, and we're kind of expecting hopefully the MCLs to come first, but um, probably by the end of February, early March, we should see all of those starting to come out and some additional actions. So keep your fingers crossed. We'll, those will be coming quickly and, and start getting the rest of the country on the same track. Oh, Abby, so, can I ask? I would raise my hand, but then I'd have to call myself and that would be weird. Um, it'd be awkward, if, yes. If, if they come up with those new MCLs, say, does that automatically kick our MCLs to that level? So what happens is the... I mean, I know um, it won't start till like 2025 or something, the federal ones, but... Each state has the opportunity to adopt the, the federal standards. So okay. the state of Michigan would go through the process of adopting those additional um, standards. So our standards would go from 8 and 16 down to 4 and down 4. four. Um, but we would look at them to make sure that that process is going to line up with ours. So we would have to write our own rule set to promulgate these new standards into this into the state MCLs, the State Drinking Water Act, um, so that it would officially. So there would be time for us to do that, but we're hoping to do that on an expedited process as quickly as possible. Um, so when that happens, you guys will definitely get um, notice so that you guys can be in on the public comment period. There will be a public comment period and um, if you want to write letters of support or whatever, anything else, um, you'll you'll we'll give you a heads up when that happens. But EPA needs to set their standards first, and then um, most of the other states will have three years to adopt those standards, and three years for the for the uh, water supplies to come into um, to actually start using the standards and come into compliance. So it's a you know they don't 
just roll them out and then expect yeah. everybody to comply. So it gives a little time. We're trying to be a little bit more aggressive and try to get that taken care of as quickly as possible. Good. All right. Uh, Joe and then Lynn. So the I guess the uh, important question is issuing a new uh, uh, standard is one thing, but is there any financing package being considered? <laughs> For municipal water supplies, Joe, yes. is that what you're talking about? Um, not that I know of. Not that I know of. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of luckily for our state, a lot of the supplies already know kind of what they have to do. But there will be some of these supplies like, you know, when we talk about public water supplies, we usually think about the big systems, you know, city of Grand Rapids, city of Detroit, those kinds of things. But we're talking even about the little systems that might be a mobile home park that serves, you know, a thousand people in the mobile home park but has one well and very limited funds so those are the kinds of supplies that we're trying to work with to try to figure out what's their best solutions how do we assist them in coming into compliance in a way that they can afford and in a way that is they can maintain so um, sometimes it might be that they might have to merge with another they might have to hook up to, to a, a bigger municipal system in order to keep that community supply um, in, in actual compliance. So at this point, there's not, you know, I think we'll do what we can to help and assist, but I, there isn't a specific fund specifically to um, get those uh, get those systems into compliance. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Lynn and then John. Okay, I'll keep it short. I I I find myself just not, it's not in your hands, I'm sure, but why in the world if the EPA has already studied it and has made this recommendation, why does the state need to restudy it? I I I don't comprehend that. Really? What why why it, is that? Why Yeah. Why why wouldn't their information be good information? The, um, their information is going to be good information, Lynn. We're not going to restudy it. The question, um, there's going to be one of the compounds where they're, they would be setting a standard that's higher than what we've already set. So oh, we would want to we would want to consider that um, I think it's for PFBS and so they're at like 2000 and we've set it at 420. So we would want to consider that information, see if it's going to make a huge difference, see if that's what that means to our overall program. Um, but most of it's just going to be a rollover and put it into our format and promulgate it under Michigan law so that it's official within the state of Michigan. It's okay. not going to be a, right. it's not going to be a complete review of the science. Uh, we've already looked, we've already had our human health work group and our toxicologists look at the science um, that EPA has been using around uh, okay. you know, the toxicity right. values Thank for, for this stuff. Right. So. That's good mm -hmm. to hear. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we're trying, and like I said, we're going to try to expedite it as much as we can, but normally Great. a promulgation of a rules package like this takes like 18 months, yep. but we're going to try to get it done quicker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, for, for those of us who are advocating for disadvantaged folks, like say living in a trailer park that has a single water source, where does one go to begin to educate them on options and are there options these days for you know, trying to improve the quality of the water and its distribution? Um, I would... You know, that's a great question. I would I would start with our drinking water and environmental health division here at Eagle. Um, they've got several people that are specializing specifically in PFAS, but also within their the um, the community water systems. And so they would be able to help you, uh, you know, maybe figure out the best way because sometimes often they need to have a certified operator for those systems. Oh, Ian, thank you. 
This is the expert you need to talk to right here. Ian, Ian Smith. Okay. Smith. <laughs> we love yes. Ian. So That's Ian, all, all I was going to do was help offer, me out, Ian. Money. Help me out. <laughs> Well, give me a call. Uh, we have a Ian we meet have a, John. John meet Ian. Right. <laughs> yeah. Ian. Uh, we have um we have two folks who specifically focus on manufactured housing communities, and then myself and my unit were focused primarily on on PFAS, but also other emerging contaminants. So between all of us, we can we can get you uh, pointed in the right direction. So if you want to reach out to me, uh, my email address is just smithi at michigan.gov. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Because it's not yeah, a, you. you know, none of this is an easy conversation about how to necessarily help. Because right. often it comes down to a matter of finances, right. of, yep. um, right. and whether or not they can afford to hire someone to be an operator for their system, and then all the testing that goes into it, and all that good stuff. So, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, those communities are already disadvantaged, and then they end up with this, you know, additional burden that um, puts them at even more of a disadvantage. So, yeah, then you got the social implications and you know, the news yeah. around the area and all of that's not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, I you. think um, that is my update, Sandy. All there right. you go. All right. Um, so just some nuts and bolts. I figured we, while we're ending the last year and moving on to the next year, um, just some things to clean up and some things to plan on for. I know we've had a couple of member group meetings just to brainstorm and kind of talk about how things are going. And so I'm going to rely on um, Mary and Jason for a couple of these. One thing we talked about was we have a lot of people on the list as members that either are no longer members or don't come or dropped off or moved or something. and. I wondered if we need to clean up that list so that we can bring on uh, more members. We have, I don't know how many contaminated communities. And so to have, you know, 20 people on the COG when we have, I don't know, how many communities do we have that we found, Abby? We should have a lot more people here. So. Yeah, yeah, um, possible. I, I don't know how many communities. I know we got, what, 272? Uh, Kelly can correct me. 273. Kelly, know. Kelly knows everything. She knows. So even if we got 50 communities, let's be conservative. We should have more people on here. And so I think um, one of the things we also talked about was kind of being really clear about what the expectations are for members. Like, are you expected to attend meetings or how many? Um, it, should there be an onboarding process? I think Samra brought that up before, like a orientation or something, so people know how it goes. And then different ways for recruitment. So I don't know if we want to address these issues now. Mary, did I steal your thunder on this? Mary? No, I um, okay. I, I think we were just going to throw it out there as, you know, like we do for the membership meeting. Anybody can speak, anybody can offer their thoughts and uh, go from there. Um, but we were going to vote on if we thought it was good or allowed to remove the people from the membership list who have not attended at all in 2023. There were 11 people who did not attend a single meeting. So um, it, it does not mean that they're not able to come back and join in if they choose at any time by going on the MPART website, uh, they just would not be getting any emails in the future from the COG. I think that would be it. But Kelly, that, can we do a vote on that? So the vote is, should we remove people who have not attended a meeting in 2023 from the roll call membership list? Um, oh yeah, let's take a vote. Did I do that wrong, Connie? I know you're you remind me of the Roberts rules, but it was close. Yeah, uh, it's can, good. Can, can okay. I make one one clarification? Yes. So please. we can vote with the one um, condition. Once we vote a certain number of people and uh, Call them once 
if they want to do something different this year or not. So if there is no con con contact or no New Year resolution to show up, then this vote will prevail or something like that. You know, I, I think uh, I think Samra had or no Angela had that same thought in the chat. Um, I think what we were planning on doing is if we went ahead with this vote that we were going to send an email to them just informing them that they were going to be removed. Um, I think uh, if because actually a month or two ago we had sent a notice to the whole cog asking if they wanted to be removed from the membership list and i did not hear anybody anything back from anybody but um so i think what we would do is we would probably draft a letter and send it and say to those particular people that they are being, you know, uh, removed from the list unless we hear from them. Yeah, we, yeah, we have sent a few. E I'm sorry, Mary. Does that sound okay to people? We have sent emails to various people asking about their interest, and we haven't heard back. So it's not the first time they this has come up. I'm just trying to clean up logs. Tony, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just had a. I just had a comment similar to Joe's, I, I, and which I think, if I understood what Mary just said, makes sense. I, 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 just the notion of giving them notice that if you, you know, like if you don't respond within so many days, then we're going to remove you. Um, I think that's a. If if I was advising a client, that's what I would advise. So. All right. So, so with that caveat, that we will send them <clears throat> notice saying you've got three weeks to get back to us or else you're off the list. They are still welcome to attend. This meeting is open to the public. Anybody can attend. Then let's take a vote and see. So Kelly, can you go ahead and take the vote? Yep. Um, so members are going to say yes or no. Yes. Uh, Sandy, you should have a second to your motion. And actually, oh. somebody other than you should should make the motion because okay. you're running the meeting. So I could make a motion. Should we remove the members that haven't attended in 2023? And we need a second for that. I can second it. Yeah, this is John. OK, good. Is there so any like discussion? <laughs> OK, all right. So we're ready now to go. Oh, OK. Angela. Yes. Brad. Yes. Connie. Yes. Daniel Brown. Yes. Dave Wynn. Yes. Gail Dugan. Gail did not answer, but he did uh, put in the chat, no, still getting information out to people. So I'm guessing he's voting no, and he's saying, I'm just guessing here, that he thinks we need to make sure we've got a way to get information out to people in those communities. But I'm guessing what he meant. Okay. Jason? Yes. Joe? Yes. John, you're mu muted. I am. Yes, thank you. Lynn Knopf? Yes. Lynn McIntosh? Yes. Mary? Yes. Patty? Yes. Rick? Yes. Sandy? Yes. Shalane? Yes. Stacy Taylor? Yes. Tony? Sorry, yes. Bill? 
Yeah. Tamara. He is on the phone, so I don't know. But I think we guess his habit. So. Um, so Mary, will somebody from membership send out an email to all of those members and make sure they know? And yep, yeah, I'll uh, get a response. I'll draft May. something and send it to Daniel oh. and Joe, and then we'll send it on to uh, you and Jason, and then we'll send it on to the group. How's that all sound? Right. Go ahead, this Sam. Is Teresa this is Teresa, Teresa on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Don't forget about me, guys. <laughs> don't forget about me. <laughs> all right. What's your vote on that? Yes. Okay. Here we go. Thanks, Teresa. Um, all right, so with that then comes the next idea, and I'm kind of flipping through these, is that we need to recruit both in the, the communities where members were that aren't able to attend, but also in new communities. And I don't know the best way to recruit people to come here to the COG. I've been to a lot of um, community meetings and um, Abby, you've always got a slide up about the COG and try to get people involved. I don't know if it would help for us to set up a table there where we can talk to people. I don't know the best way to recruit people, but um, I think I think the more people we have participate, the stronger the voice, the more views we see, the more ideas we get. So I'd just like to open that up for ideas on how do we recruit more people to come to the COG and be active members. Um, this is Mary. I, I've attended a few of the local, or actually more than a few, um, of the local official calls that MPART makes at the beginning of an investigation, um, or as their uh, initial call to the local officials. Um, in those, there there is the slide, and um, generally Abby and Kelly uh, do a good job as far as telling them about the uh, COG and that, but I wonder if as an initial step, um, we have talked at meetings about where some municipalities probably would not uh, participate, but I'm wondering if as we gain new uh, groups, should I send from membership uh, the application and ask uh, those municipalities to pass it on to any uh, citizens that they think might be interested, um, because most of those meetings, they will um, ask if uh, they can have MPART and EGLE and MDHHS set up a meeting for their residents. So um, as Sandy said, you know, it might be possible for us to actually go there, but in the cases of us not being able to actually attend, um maybe sending a letter of introduction directly to the municipality i'd be willing to do that if um anybody thinks that's helpful what do you guys think anybody tony your hand is up are you no, i'm sorry i should i just didn't take yeah. it down okay lynn Yes, I'm not quite sure I know what I'm going to say, but um, I think sending it to the municipalities in theory is a good idea, but I'm not sure how effective it is. Um, and I'm wondering if we can brainstorm about other ways to do it as well. I mean, it doesn't hurt, but I, I don't know as if municipalities are going to make um, a great effort at that. Um, I really think it'd be great as much as possible if one of us would be able to, to attend some of these meetings and actually speak at those meetings officially, just to say I'm a member of the COG and this is why I'm part of it. To hear it from a person who's actually a member as part of the meeting, I think is very effective. I don't know if that you know, meets protocol or not for how the meetings need to go, but I'm going to listen to a lot more to someone who actually stands up and says, hey, you know, I, I get it. You know, this is there's a lot going on here, a lot of angles. 
um, this is why I've joined or continue to be part of this group versus someone who's part of the agency just saying saying it. I don't know. It's just just a thought. Lynn, can you clarify, are, are you talking specifically about a resident meeting or about those local official calls? Oh, I'm talking about a meeting with residents, but I, I would think okay. it'd be great with local, local municipal people too. <laughs> a lot of them really, you know, I don't know. I think, I don't know about that. I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak on that. I don't know. But okay. I think the more that actual people can physically be there, it's better, I think. So. Okay. I agree. Um, all right, Angela and then Dave. Yes, thank you. I was just thinking, um, I'm still fairly new to the COG, so I'm not sure if this is an idea that's been thrown out there. But um, have we sent requests for membership um, to different university Department of Sustainabilities? Because I'm guessing there's probably a few environmental students that would be interested in joining around Michigan. No, we have not. That's that's a good idea. Yeah. Perfect. Hmm. Yeah, I think just like a quick email would work because um, I went to MSU and like I, I could forward that to the CSUS department, the Community Sustainability Department, but then also I'm sure like U of M and all the other universities have like advisors for community sustainability that they could just send it to all the students. Great, mm -hmm. great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Dave and then Daniel. Yeah, Sandy, I think one of the, we probably have a lot of good resources and where I'm going is if you talk about groups like Geopan, Ecology Center, National Wildlife Federation, LCV, Okay, the Sierra Club, they get involved with members throughout the state every day. And that might be an area where, you know, communication with those groups could, uh, you know, could obviously get, get a lot of, in, a lot of good information out to the people. That's a really good idea. If we could get some of those applications and Right, MLCV and some of those could hand them out when they're doing their canvassing and contaminated areas and stuff. They could do the legwork for us. I love that. Well, yeah, the Ecology Center, I mean, yeah. they're, they're working with people every day. You yeah. got National Wildlife Federation, they're working with people every yeah. day. So yeah, GeoPan, all of those, good. Um, another good idea. Okay, Daniel. Yeah, a lot of good ideas already on the table. <clears throat> you know, Lynn, I think, brought up a really good point about you know, basically re COG representation at meetings where it's appropriate or other events. And this is this is something I sort of like to put on the wish list as well. You know, what, I, what I'm not sure about how to do is like, how do we choose sort of the regime that we want to serve? So, you know, do we each want to serve a county or a community or, you know, sort of what's the boundary do we set? But you know, if a meeting was happening in Livingston or Oak Leaden County in our watershed, I would, you know, certainly be happy to to be there, even if not in a speaking role, just being there sort of as like a community liaison. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good role for for us to play. You know, if, if other people have concerns and they want to come up and talk to us and you know, then we can you know talk to them about the cog and, and try to hear their perspective. I think that's a really good good idea that Lynn had. Uh, Angela stole another of my ideas, which is, you know, the universities are really great. So that was a really good idea. Uh, you know, we, we have a long list of groups that we work with at the Watershed Council. Uh, you know, some other groups that I'd like to hear more from that have been really helpful on this issue and others. Groups that are, you know, really involved in sort of community advocacy around drinking water. Uh, paddling groups, you know, lake homeowner associations also have a stake in this. Um, and and then, you know, a mix of municipal officials, particularly those that are on environmental commissions, sustainability commissions, uh, or, or other groups that have some sort of environmental association through a zoning board or, you know, or, or other committee, I think would be great. We have a long list of those people um, for our own watershed. Whenever I've 
had a chance to recruit people. I've tried to make the pitch, but apparently I'm not a I'm not a great recruiter. Uh, but I think that that's that's a good. You know, th those are the perspectives that I would like to hear more of. They've been useful to me in the past and other things. Great. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Connie. Yeah, just a real practical one for the film at Troy, where they're going to have the no defense. Why not have Tony really play it up to the people after they see the film? No defense. Just hey, a no, Tony. Yes. Hey, no, that's a I'd good happy, idea. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and if there's if there is any if if the if the group has any set of materials that they would like, you know, to be presented like at a table or something, um, I'm, you can certainly look that out. But I'm happy to put a plug in for sure. So it sounds like we've got some really good ideas. Um, it's just a bit. I I always get the um, and you guys probably do too. The thing from M part, the updated sites every week, and so I try to look at those. And if they have meetings and they're in the general area and I can fit them in. I try to go to those meetings. Abby, is it? it's not a problem, I'm assuming. You just keep looking at me like, why are you here, weirdo stalker? But um, <laughs> No, no, it's great. I, and I I do think it, you guys are absolutely right. It, it helps to have that personal touch from the community of somebody who's, you know, kind of walked in those shoes ahead of time saying, yep, that you know you can you can listen to the what they're saying or perhaps give your you know your thoughts on the matter um but i do think it helps so i think there's a a, a potential for being able to incorporate some of these ideas okay good um so with that then once we get more members i think we do need to kind of talk about yes i saw that lowell city landfill one i wanted to go to that but i can't maybe patty you're in is uh is Patty Baldwin still on? And and John's over there. Okay, John, and John, yeah, maybe we can John, get some clock maybe John can get to the Lowell one. And then yeah, say, have... um, um, I'm sorry, I, I I the signal was dropping out a little bit for some reason. I'm not sure where it, okay. we where we ended up there. There's a there's a meeting in Lowell uh the end of this month that we're. Okay. They were showing on the calendar there. If you check that calendar out, you can see where some community meetings are, and that would be a good place to start, as well as reaching out to others. Once we do that, I think membership committee, maybe you guys can work on expectations and onboarding and stuff. And I know we're almost at 8 o'clock, so I'm going to quickly set the stage for future meetings. Uh, Joe had brought up at one meeting that it would be really good for us to kind of set goals or talk about like what is our purpose and what are we trying to achieve so we can kind of um recognize if we're making progress or if we're doing what our mission and our our charter was was set up to do i think that's really important to do periodically especially because the cog has been up and running now for a while so it's always good to sit and look at it and and kind of update and readjust so maybe that's a conversation we can plan on having at the February meeting. So if people could come with thoughts about that, like what our goals are and review that charter and say, is that still working for us? And is that what we need? I think that will be a good place so we know what we're trying to do in the future. So I gave us six minutes left after we're all tired after last night's game. Uh, any other comments on that or other thoughts for future meetings? Future things we need to address. Sandy, I'm wondering about um, when the last membership meeting, we are member only meeting. We did say that, or some of the people said that they thought it was a good idea to continue those. Um, I'm wondering if we want to have, like we have done in the past, where we sometimes have two meetings a month, or if we want to alternate or something like that. We can talk about it at the next, but we we can send even an email around to members to see if they okay. want another member only meeting. OK. I you know, my personal bias is if we're going to have a meeting, let's just have a meeting. But Joe, you've got your hands up. Yes, they like everything else we do in life. 
we got to have uh, financing in our activity somehow. Our own funding or uh, state funding or federal funding that could bring some action to our committee. If we have some funding, I'm sure we can anticipate a lot more activities by all kinds of members. So uh, let's think about it in the next meeting. And uh, Debbie, you know, please help. <laughs> what are the reasonable places we can even think about? Because if you got a funding, we can be a lot more productive. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. Um, yeah, Empart doesn't really have much of a budget, so right. we're usually begging for begging for funds as it is. But um, if you've got specific ideas. Joe, about what that might look like, we can certainly talk about ways to think outside the box. Okay. Right. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Yes. So we've got our ideas for the next meeting. As always, let me know if you've got other ideas so we can uh, get them on the schedule and work with Abby and everybody at any other presentations or topics you'd like. And uh, we're down three minutes early. So happy new year. Happy New Thanks, Year, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Happy New Year, All right. everybody. Okay. Bye. See ya. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.